So before we get started, I think it'd be a good idea to have a kind of point of reference, see where we all are. Um, who here has heard of Blendle? Raise your hand. Okay, so that's... This is good. I like this. That's like 80%. How many of you are paying 10 bucks a month for a Blendle Premium account? Yeah, that's a little bit less. We've got to work on uh, acquisition. <laughs> so I think for the 20% of people who have no idea who you are and what you do, do you want to fill in the blanks? So basically, I was a technology journalist and uh, never got to work at the Next Web, um, but uh, uh, close. I worked for a couple of Dutch newspapers writing columns. And at some point, we made a documentary series for, a Dutch, uh, for Dutch public broadcasting about Silicon Valley. So I got to interview Jan Koom of, uh, of WhatsApp, and the, the, the Google guys behind the self-driving car, and um, an, amazing, an amazing trip. And at the same time, I was writing for newspapers, and you get to see journalism from the inside. And there's a lot to like. There's a lot of beautiful um, articles, newspapers, magazines being made. But the love that people in, in news have for a print newspaper, like they really admire the spacing and the sort of how big are the letter and what's the fonts, and they really like that stuff. They don't really like building products for the internet, a lot of them. And I have that. I, I, get, I get really happy when there's a, like when you have a really nice onboarding and you get a nice sort of hover animation when you hover a button and stuff. That makes me happy. So I was like, what 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 can I do to combine um, you know my shared my my passion for journalism and combine that with a, sh a passion for product. So in the end, journalism is not in a great shape. Just no. as television is not in a great shape. Just as music before Spotify, I guess before iTunes was not in a great shape. Journalism is kind of the same. I, I don't know how many of you here have, uh, have an ad blocker installed on your computer. That's almost everyone. And how many of you have a subscription to a newspaper? That's like 20 people. So, uh, and that's the problem uh, right there. So I have a fundamental belief that if the product becomes nice enough, Spotify is a beautiful product. If the product becomes nice enough, people are willing to pay. Um, but in the way we do it right now in journalism, with paywalls and different sites, and having no one to guide you through the, the, the sort of all the content that there is, um, if only there was a company that had all the major sources that showed no paywalls, that helps you find the best content from the New Yorker, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, whatever. If only there was a platform that make it very easy to find the best content for you, whether you like drones or, I don't know, stories about interviews, profiles with startup founders or whatever, um, as long as it's easy to find stuff, I'm sure you will be willing to pay for it, as you probably do with Spotify or Netflix. So I want to change an industry. That's basically what we're trying to do. No pressure whatsoever. No pressure whatsoever. So um, I have a feeling you might be a little bit biased, but do you think the advertising uh, revenue model for journalism is fucked? Yes, very much so. Uh, and um, for, for a whole, of, whole lot of different reasons, the fact that everyone in this office, or everyone in this room basically installs an ad blocker, goes through the trouble of installing one, I think that already says a lot about our relation to ads on the web. But honestly, it also, it fucks up journalism in a major way. Because suddenly the incentive becomes getting as many clicks as possible. And if your incentive is to get as many clicks as possible, you'll get headlines like, eight reasons why you want so-and-so in a picture of a cat, and you know, the stuff that Facebook lives on, let's be honest. This is what Facebook does, is giving us a funnel towards sort of completely clickbaity. You know, if, if a robot could write the clickbait, that would be awesome, probably, for Facebook. Uh, yet, I don't think that's particularly the best sort of value that journalism can bring. No. And um, uh, if you incentivize journalists based on how many your users, human users, are willing to pay for the product that you're offering, I think you'll do a better job in serving that user in a way that he thinks is not only worth his time, but also his money. Um, and I think the journalism gets a lot better when people pay for it, uh, just as much as Netflix is a lot better than a lot of cable TV. But is that necessarily true, though? Because in the UK, where I'm from, people pay for journalism. They pay for newspapers like the Daily Mail, which you know, they, they don't pay for the facts because it's, it's demonstrably false, all the things they say. They pay for things that, that conform to their political outlook. Mm. Yeah. I, don't I don't think, you know, the, the, 
uh, sort of the tabloidy newspapers, I, I don't think they will exist in a couple of years. I think those will be the first to die. I hope so. Will they offer no, they offer no service um, that is not also available for free on the web? Um, so there is not a whole lot to differentiate yourself on if you're a tabloid. I think it's the hardest business. I think you can try to monetize a bit with e-commerce, but it's a tough business. You're not going to pay, you know, f even five bucks a month probably for the sun. Yeah. It's a tough sell. Yeah. So I wish these people luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, you've had, uh, just from your background, you've had a bird's eye overview of, of both U.S. politics, but also of the journalism industry. Were you surprised by the, the scale of fake news in, in the 2016 election and the impact it had? Um, no, because fake news essentially is sort of, the reason why fake news lives is because we click on it. And the reason we click on it is because it's very well crafted. Yeah. It plays to our emotions, it plays to our, to our fears, to, you know, it, it plays to a lot of very human elements, exactly the reason why um, for the same reason that there's a lot of clickbait, for the same reason that we have, you know, so many uh, publishers now creating, let's just be honest, shit content to overflow Facebook in the hope that they can monetize that with ads. Exactly the same principle that makes, uh, you know, a shitty slideshow on some blog uh, with ads around it work, or the stuff that you find in Taboola or Outbrain, you know, these related articles, things under article, and where they're like, be rich in 30 days, or all that shit. Yeah, I don't, you, most of you don't see this because you have an ad blocker, but this is stuff that normal people on the internet see. Um, and uh, it's exactly the same, the same incentives being used. And if you are very good at doing clickbait, and if you're very good at doing, uh, right, doing marketing for a story, so to say, I think you can have a big impact, uh, for example, on an election, and that there's a, a big responsibility for platforms like Facebook, and luckily they take responsibility now because there's enough pressure, um, but if, if it weren't for media pressure or political pressure, I don't know if Facebook would have taken the same step as quickly as they have done now. Yeah, I mean, the response to, to the whole fake news thing from Facebook was pretty swift, pretty decisive. Um, but flipping the question around, do you, uh, it kind of feels that, like in the West we're a lot more divided, certainly after Brexit, Trump uh, and the recent French election. Do you think that there's a role that journalists can play to kind of bridge that divide? To bring us together? Yeah. Honestly? I don't think so. It's a bit cynical. Maybe, I'm too cynic Maybe it's a thing that I'm, I'm cynical today, but I think if there's anything that's happening is that we're getting, you know, this is why the discussion about the filter bubble is such a, is such an, it's such a thing that people like to talk about. Um, but there, when we introduce the product that helps you guide uh, through the news, you have people that, on the one hand, are not satisfied because they say, I want to choose my own news, I don't, I don't need you to guide me through what I want to read. And on the other hand, you have the perspective of people that don't want to f be faced with a choice all the time. They're like, take me by the hand, there's too much information, I can't handle all this information. Sure. So users want personalization and they really don't want personalization. That's a hard thing to kind of figure something out in the middle. But in the end, the reason why we all use Google instead of fucking Bing or whatever else there is, is because it's really not nice to use Bing. Yeah. And the reason why it's not yeah, nice to use Bing is because it's not personalized as much as Google is, because Bing hasn't gotten the chance to get to know us while Google has. And that's why they're in a much better position. I think exactly the same is true for news, and if anything, we'll see more fragmented, um, fragmented media, I think. We'll see more and more uh, you know, the, the idea of the filter bubble now, I think it will, that will, will become a much, much, much bigger problem. And I don't really see how journalism is the sort of, um, the thing that will bind us all together. I think people pay for a service that plays a role in their lives, and something most of the time plays a role in your life, is it something that you kind of agree with. This is not saying that I think this is right. I'm, I'm trying to do the opposite. I'm trying to create sort of, I'm forcing stories about Syria to our users. Well, I know that people don't tend to click on stories about Syria when they can also look at a, look at a I don't know. Nice Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston, whatever. Um, but it's kind of going against the grain there of what makes business sense. Oh. So if journalism isn't the answer, what is? I don't know. 
I, I, luckily, this is not my problem to solve uh, <laughs> because I think it's a very tough problem, and I honestly think it's going to—it's only going to get worse. Yeah. And. I guess this is just what we want. We want Netflix to completely personalize to our taste. I, bu I watched a bunch of Japanese series on Netflix. You, not a lot of people know this, but there's great Japanese TV on Netflix, and I greatly enjoy it. But now Netflix is completely Japanese for me. I, I enjoy it, but that's the reason why I keep coming back to that thing. Um, and uh, we just like it when stuff feels good for us. And so that's why personalization is obviously going to get, get worse from this perspective. Yeah. Um, moving back to Blendle, one of the things I find most interesting about your model is that uh, you let people get refunds. Uh, on Because if you've ever read an article that was clickbait bullshit, and you're like, I want my 10 minutes back, well, now you can actually get your uh, you know, 50 cents back. Or exactly. Whatever. So th and this was super scary. When we, we thought about this on a Friday afternoon, uh, my co-founder said, why don't we introduce a functionality that if people paid, they can ask for their money back? And I was like, no, you can't trust the people on the internet. They will all ask for their money back. This can never, we can't have nice things. Uh, so, um, but it turned out that no one uses it and that really? people really start reading more because they know in the back of their mind. It's just, I guess when you buy shoes, you know you can send them back. That makes you buy the, the shoes in the first place. Uh, so I guess it's the same with article. It just works for us, uh, which is really nice. We introduced a model now where people can also take a subscription, and with that, we let people exchange stories. So when we give you a story, you can exchange this for a new one. Right. And it's kind of, you have access to a lot of content, but still people really like this sense of control. So in the end, it's a UI thing. It's very much a product thing. It's, it's sort of the feeling that you get as a user. It gives you a sense of control and freedom, um, and that works really well for us. Yeah, the publishers were really scared about this in the beginning, and now they just see that people buy more, so it's no problem anymore. So, like, as a percentage, what would you say like the refund request rate is? I think right now it's about 15% or something like that. Okay. But we see that if we don't offer the functionality, people tend to read way less. Right. So just the, the fact that you know that you can ask for your money back will make people not use it. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, one of the things I find most intriguing about Blendle is that you've absolutely thrived, uh, and I don't mean it like in, uh, you, you, you have thrived, you've got amazing coverage in the international press, you've got amazing like, uh, interest, um, and it's a product that's only, that was initially only available in a country of 17 million people. You moved into Germany now, and I think the US? So we'll, we'll, we, we're in beta in the United States, and uh, yeah, we're, work, we're working on it. Yeah, put it uh, like that. So, why do you think people should launch startups in the Netherlands when you consider it such a small market? Great question. I mean, I was talking to someone from Spotify yesterday, and if Spotify would have launched in the United States right off the bat, that would be very hard. Um, getting publishers on board in a country like Sweden was much easier than in a huge market like the United States. So, we have two aspects. One of it is getting sort of a product market fit, and the other one is you're working with partners. We're working with publishers, and we need them to be happy, because uh, otherwise we have a store that there's no, when there's, Spotify would be pretty boring without songs. Let's put it like that. So, it's the same for Blendl. And um, uh, I guess convincing publishers in a smaller country uh, where the stakes are different, not per se higher or lower, but different. It's, in Holland, it was much easier to do that. And because we did it in Holland, it becomes a little bit easier to convince publishers in other countries, and now it's even the case that they come to us. So I guess doing it on a smaller scale first, uh, if you're working with, with partners, is really nice, because you can fuck up more, and you can, uh, you know, you know, people tend to give you more leeway in a small market. I think that's one. And the other one is that we can now, there's, when, you, when you do a startup, there's so many things that you don't know. And the only way that you f figure out how it works is just by trying shit. And no one knows, everyone is, al everyone is always talking and reading the, the, reading the tech crunch of this world and the growth hacker shit and all, and everyone is always, people are like, oh, you, you should do this and you should have an opt, well, I don't know. Everyone is always talking you, t telling you what to do, but the honest thing is that no one knows what the hell they're doing. And uh, the only way to figure it out is just try. I feel like it's like a game where you, you know, try to conquer the balls as much as possible, and then at some point you do, and you go to the next level, and then you know, up, up and up and up and up. And I see that's what it's like. It's 
it's dealing with your own in uh, sort of inadequacy. It's just dealing with all the stuff that you can cannot do. So um, I guess that's what it is to that's what it is to be a founder in, in to some extent. And getting to product market fit in Holland and making more mistakes here, no one gives a shit if you if you fuck up. Um, well, people in Holland might, but that doesn't tra travel to the United States. Well, if we would do something stupid in the United States, it would be become a big thing. So it's much easier to try things in a smaller market, and I think Holland is perfect for it um, because we are very, very. T we, we try things out much quicker than the Germans, for example. We're very willing to pay for stuff on the web much more than the Germans, for example. They go to their supermarkets and give people cash. This is the Germans. The Dutch are always like, where can I, where can I give my uh, digital payment thingy? Um, so it's, for a lot of reasons, Holland is a really nice place to try it out, I think. And then if it works, move it over to other countries. But now you're moving to the United States, which sounds like it's going to be quite a, a challenge for you guys. Um, could you just talk about your plans for that market? Because I'm really curious to know how you're going to, you know, there's some entrenched players in there. I'm very curious as well, sir. Now it's there, uh, there is uh, there is still a whole lot of work to be done, but uh, I'm very confident that uh, we have a we have a product now that we feel like is very close to uh, what I'll proudly ship in the United States. Oh, that's exciting! Have you got anyone signed up already, or can you not talk about that? We announced uh, two weeks ago that we have um, the New Yorker and Vanity Fair to Condé Nast titles, oh. uh, which are two beautiful titles. I think over the next coming of coming months, you'll see us announcing some uh, some some stuff. Awesome. So we have uh, just shy of five minutes left. You mentioned you wanted to uh, have a bit of a Q and A with the audience. So if you guys have any questions you want to ask, uh, just raise your hand. Hi, uh, my name's Maeve. I work for Ingenico ePayments. But we were having a conversation about how. Uh, in this world of uh, tech, everything's moving towards a democratization of information, right? And which is essentially what you're doing. But one of the consequences of that, uh, or side effects, could be a breaking down of cultural connection. Um, and so this was kind of more the thought, like, how can we be aware, how are you aware of that balance in your company? I think um, sort of people this kind of hooks into the filter bubble discussion. People on one hand want relevancy, and on the other hand, they want the sense of freedom or uh, sort of being confronted with other ideas than you'd normally have on your own. And this is, this is honestly tough because it goes into the business sense. The business sense, would, you would optimize you know, for clicks and for what people pay for. And in the end, I think, on the short term, that works, but on the long term, so this is, this is the reason why I don't, don't do it that much. For the long term, I think that people, if you only present them with stuff that fits their narrative, either, whether it's cultural or, or, or any, any other narrative that you have, I think in the long term, people will get tired of it. And this is an assumption. I don't have data to prove this, but this is my assumption. And that's the reason why we don't only confront you with stuff that's happening in your backyard or you know some, some uh, thing that feels very close to you, because I feel that in the end, you want conf con conflicting opinion. In the end, you want to be, you, you also read news to, you, you read news, I think, on a very human way to belong, to part of a group, but you always also want to get ahead. And to get ahead, you need conflicting opinion. And I think that's, Gets, uh, maybe it gets a little philosophical there, but I, I think that's, that's the reason why people essentially want to consume news, to get ahead in a way and to belong to a group. That's why we all read, I don't know, that's why we all read the next web, because we're geeks that want to read about updates on a new Android operating system and get it the minute it happens and not an hour later, while uh, a lot of people wouldn't give, really care about that. Um, if that were the only thing that we read, we feel like we're getting in the, we're, we're sitting in a little box, and it's not a comfortable idea. So, in the long term, it makes business sense to do it. On the short term, I'm afraid that this is the reason why a lot of companies keep optimizing until uh, there's nothing to optimize anymore. Okay, I think we have a question from over there. Hey, 
name is Andri. Uh, I wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, you recently raised uh, a new round of funding, and at the same time, uh, your co-founder apparently uh, has announced he's leaving the company. He's what getting is... a kid, which is good news, I guess. Yeah, yeah which is a great news, absolutely. Yeah. But what do you think, uh, what kind of effect is this going to have on the future of Blendo? Hey, has it changed uh, much, both uh, round and uh, the co-founder's uh, departure? Cheers. Yeah. Uh... I mean, the, the, my co-founder, he left, it's already a year ago, essentially, so it's already a long time ago. And I guess when you grow and the company grows, uh, these things happen, and he gets a kid, and he's really happy taking it a little bit easier right now. Um, but the company, the company is doing fine, so I'm not worried about that. Consider the funding. Uh, we raised from uh, Incav Capital, which is a Dutch VC fund, actually really interesting Dutch VC fund, and Nikkei, which is a Japanese company that you know from the stock exchange, but they recently bought uh, a quite well-known publisher called the Financial Times. Uh, and I'm very happy to have them on, as well as the New York Times and Axel Springer as investors. And what, is it, what it enables us to do is to kind of build a coalition of publishers. And I think in the end, publishers are struggling um, with their place in the world because of Facebook. 80 or more percent of their advertising revenue now goes via Facebook and Google. And a lot of the traffic that they get is going via these platforms. And they start to wonder more and more what their place is in the world. They're not technology companies very often. And they need to build great technology in order to get all of our attention. And I guess this is the role that I'm trying to play. I'm trying to change the industry, but not by serving people more videos about pandas and, and other shit that's, that's been taken care of by Facebook. Um, what I really want to do is make sure that the quality that a company like Netflix, for example, offers you in video, that quality is something that um, is the alternative and that you'll have a platform that offers quality as an alternative for Facebook. Uh, that's, our, that's our mission. And I think having, a, having these great publishing houses, and I think they're some of the most innovative in the world uh, on board as investors, I think can only help us. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there, but uh, Alex, thanks so much, dude. Thank you. Cheers.